the year. Um, these workshops are typically short and only a few people get to present. So the more frequently we do them, the more people will get to share their experience. And so one of the things in making the community is to establish a website or a web page. And I have to thank Stasia Engel for that. She offered uh, to do that as part of SGD. And in fact, Stasia has been working to uh, set up a web page for us. Um, this web page, uh, we could imagine, would have a list of experiments. It would have a list of brew members that you can contact with expertise and people who have done certain experiments. It would have sources of strains and reagents and protocols. And it would, could also have links to general uh, topics of interest, such as upcoming events and funding sources, etc. And so the idea is that the web page would be a one stop for everyone who wants to uh, use yeast as a teaching tool in, in, their, in their classroom. And so in order to get this uh, going and to involve more and more people in this, uh, we thought that it would be a good idea to have a steering committee. And so the idea of the steering committee, and this is all tentative and something we can discuss in the breakout room, it would be six to eight people of diverse backgrounds. So some would be seniors, some would be junior, some from small institutes, some from big institutes, from all over the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it would be a two-year commitment and half the committee would rotate off every year so you have the excitement of the people who just bored and then you have the experience of the people who are doing it for the second year and then uh, you have to you get to skip your third burnout year and rotate off um, and finally the responsibilities would include the web page identifying people to uh, organize the workshop so the committee doesn't have to organize the workshop themselves they can identify people to do that to advertise brew, to get other people who are not yeast researchers to, to participate, et cetera. So uh, we can talk more about this. I will send out an email tonight regarding uh, volunteering for the steering committee. At this point, we will select the people for the first steering committee, but after that, the steering committee will select the people for the steering committee. Um, and so as you're listening to the talks or during the breaks or when you're getting coffee, try to think of ideas for this uh, brew network and we can talk about this more later in the breakout room or you can just email me at any time you all have my email and if you don't you will have it by tonight and uh, that's it I will stop sharing and back to Mary all right that's fantastic thank you so much Orna um, so we're going to get started with our speakers there's one thing I wanted to do really quickly we had lots and lots of really fantastic um, abstracts um, we, we squeezed as many in as we could um, we had uh, one, one of our attendees, um, I, I offered to give shout outs to any of our abstract submissions who would like for me to. So I'm going to give a shout out to Ashik Katru um, at Concordia. And he um, writes that they um, use systems genetics and synthet synthetic biology in repurposing model organisms and they replace human genes in yeast or other simplified cells. So they've done a lot of functional replaceability um, assays and they um, are looking for sort of human equivalents. Uh, they are engineering human biological processes in their entirety in yeast. So that is something that we can include in information we spread out forward through the network. Um, he wasn't able to give a talk, um, but uh, just so you know, he, um, that was a person who appreciated the shout out. So the last thing I'm going to do, and then we're going to get started with our talks, and our first speaker um, is going to be Joe Keeney to give Jill a, a heads up. But before I do, knowing what you're about to hear, this is my advice for the next hour. These are the things I think that would be great for you to um, notice in the talks. Um, they're really powerful um, so that you can bring real research back to your um, teaching environments. Um, the idea that we can have complex ex experimental approaches that can be streamlined and, and, and used in yeast with undergraduates, that you can exemplify outstanding scientific process um, in the yeast model system, that your topics can be exciting, genome editing to um, health, to environment, to evolution, um, lots of exciting topics that um, a lot of these topics will extend the understanding that students gain in this model system to a broader audience. And then finally, there's a lot of people who are developing um, course for undergraduate research experiences, course related or cures in this room. It's a great resource if you're thinking about doing that. We strongly encourage you to, um, to, to, to continue to think about doing that and maybe even do it. So I'm going to be quiet, um, stop being awkward, and I'm going to let our first speaker um, go ahead and get started. This is Jill Keeney from Juniata College. She's going to talk about yeast gene discovery, flexible models for challenging times, and I will mute myself and hand off to Jill. All right, thank you very much, Mary. Uh, let me take a moment here and share my screen. Okay, um, and then hopefully everybody can see my slides. 
um, very quickly, I'm not going into um, the presentation mode because my computer kept crashing. So I'm going to be telling you about um, a yeast gene discovery um, NSF funded project we have going called the Yeast Orphan Gene Project. Some of you, I know, have been to workshops. I saw you on the list and may have heard about it. Today, I'm also going to be emphasizing the um, bioinformatics part of our project because this is something that can be done remotely. And it is a, a, a course based uh, research type project and very flexible. So if you are looking where you need something to do remotely, um, this might be something that might work for you. Um, so um, the, um, the premise of our project is that um, the annotation status of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, when you look, we still have about 10% of the gene is uncharacterized. And so that gives us um, a lot of genes to be looked at and for students to look at in classes that might allow them um, to do some real inve investigations into gene function. So quickly, our project goals um, for the NSF funded grant is to have a consortium of undergraduate faculty that um, brings together, coordinates resources for students to be able to assign molecular functions to orphans, or we also call them GUFs, genes of unknown function. Really quickly on definitions, orphan made a cute grant title, but an orphan, strictly speaking, is a taxonomically isolated gene of function for the purpose of projects in classes or for research, we consider more a GUF, a gene of unknown function, where at least one of the main gene ontology terms is annotated as unknown um, in SGD. So that's how we define working on a gene through our project. Um, so the project format, um, particularly for the informatics part of the project, a gene of unknown function, a, gore, a GUF or an orphan, um, is selected for students to work on. And that can be pre-selected or you can have students select it. Um, I have put in here links to various um, links on our project website. And we have a page where students can go that gives them information about how to select their own orphan. Once a gene or a GUF is uh, selected, students work through informatics modules for that selected gene. This can be guided within the classroom or students can do this completely independently, either as part of a course or as a research project. The modules, um, which I'll review in, an inst in a minute, are not designed to be sequential. So there's a lot of flexibility in how much course time you use, and they can be selected for whatever class you want to use them for. Using that collected data, students then build a hypothesis. This can be done remotely. And new this summer, I have a student making walkthrough videos. So students, if they're unsure about what they're doing, can watch the YouTube video of a student stepping through the module with a gene, and then they can have some confidence, okay, I'm doing this correctly. Um, quickly, what the modules cover is a brief introduction, basically showing them what's on the Saccharomyces genome database in BLAST looking at structure-based evidence, doing multiple sequence alignments, looking at cellular localization algorithms and cellular localization um, databases, and then the more advanced modules look at gene deletion phenotypes or physical interactors. Um, those can all be um, downloaded um, at the project website. Um, and actually, they are also now, I put a link on SGD at the Education Wiki, so they're there as well. Some student examples, what might you do with these modules? Um, one gene, um, YFR0012W, um, modeling predicts um, that there's four membrane spanning domains. However, when you look at the entry for the gene, there's no annotation about where it is in the cell. So from there, a student might be able to think about, well, what, what membrane might that protein be localized in the cell? What does that mean? And look at some of the ev evidence to think, um, can they find anything about what organelle it might be located in? Another gene, um, YER066W, um, an example on the bottom left is looking at a gene expression map, a co-expression gene um, interaction map, and then you can send a student to investigate the function of some of those other interacting proteins trying to gain clues for function. This particular gene has a PFAM hit with two WD40 domains. So then you can send students to develop, delve into the literature about, well, what is that motif and what is its function? Um, so there's wet labs um, as part of the project to complement the informatics. So I'll just mention these. 
um, students we have when we do a wet lab and can be in the lab in person, they do gene deletion construction and confirmation, colony formation assays, fluorescence microscopy, um, budding indices, um, or similar types of experiments. Um, the workshops, so as part of the project, um, we have workshops every year, um, and these are hands-on workshops where we have up to 24 participants um, come together to work through the lab and the informatics modules and to collaborate about how they might use these their institutions. We delayed this year's workshop because of the pandemic, so hopefully we'll be meeting 2021 in June. Um, in at North Central College in Naperville, Illinois with Steve Johnson hosting. And then in 2022, we hope to be at Ohlone Community College in California with um, Laurie uh, hosting the workshop. Um, so finally, also we have assessment. So on our website, there are pre and post assessment links that are available. Um, anyone using these in their classes, we'd really like them to give their students the pre and post assessment. That's being coordinated by Tammy Tobin at Susquehanna University. And um, instruct instructors that have completed pre and post assessments, they can get their specific course results from Tammy. Um, so this is this um, from this past year. Um, we have our pre and post tests ask questions by different categories and students do show significant gains in all those areas. So finally, I just want to acknowledge the National Science Foundation and then also um, my project steering committee. So I will uh, yeah, stop share. Okay. All right. All right. So it looks like we have a question from Nicholas. Um, Nicholas, would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Sure. Sorry, it took me a while um, to unmute myself. Multiple screens here. So um, my question is whether the genes of unknown function that you have as sort of orphans um, are those always protein coding or are there also non coding genes? Right. So we have, particularly for intro level classes, we've focused on the protein coding verified ORFs um, and haven't gotten so much into that. But in upper level classes, or if you had an independent research student, there's no reason why you couldn't do this with a non coding gene. The modules are pretty much focused on protein coding genes because they're focusing on doing protein alignments and doing cell localization, right? Um, but there are certainly lots of non-coding genes out there um, that for which the function is unknown. And so you could certainly adapt the idea to use those. Um, the modules, probably just the later, uh, more detailed modules would be the most useful, looking at protein gene expression or looking at networks. Great, awesome. thank you. So, so Jill, what kind of resources are available to the participants? Okay, so the participants, particularly those that attend the workshops, if you attend the workshop, we can help um, supply, if you attend the workshop, we can supply um, the purchased knockout, um, the deletion allele. At the workshop, we order primers and make a new, um, new version of the allele, which is always the recommended um, for your particular guff that you've chosen. So you can take those primers home with you and you have the deletion strains as well. Um, we can provide some deletion strains um, for others that can't make the workshops and primers, I'll provide either the deletion strain or the primers. Um, it just depends on, you know, as long as the budget holds out, right, then we can keep supplying strains. Yeah. Um, Michael Law, would you like to ask your question? That'll be our last question before we move on to the next talk. Sure. Um, I think I have the same question as someone else. Uh, do you have informatics sessions regarding the conservation of the genes? Um, and is it integrated into the Unimod database as far as uh, disease relevance and other types of questions you could ask? It is not integrated into the Unimod. Um, and I suppose we could try to do that. Um, a lot of these, because they're genes of unknown function, they don't really readily come up as, of course, uh, matching a gene of known function, you know, that might already be a disease gene, because otherwise they would likely not necessarily be more of known function. Um, they do include look blasting, right? Blasting against, um, you do blast, right? And then also they look at um, protein alignments, right? So they are going to be looking at um, how this compares sequence wise to other species. Um, so in that sense, yes, it has some exercises um, 
in terms of conservation. Sometimes you do get sort of little snippets in there like, okay, yeah, it's similar to this gene um, that might be involved. Often it's hypothetically a hypothetical protein for this function. Um, so to that point, um, it does, um, but we haven't developed the modules to really take genes that might be more well known or linked to disease. Does that answer your question? Ashik, did you want to add this your your addition to that question really quickly before we uh, move on? Basically, I wanted to know if you can uh, they can be identified as orthologs in other species. Um. So yes, I mean through the modules, they're going to be led to you know some of these. Frankly, what we mostly find for these genes of unknown functions is the orthologs in other species are genes of unknown function. All right. All right, thank you everyone. Let's move on to our next talk. Um, um, our next speaker is Bryce Taylor from the University of Washington Genome Sciences. And his talk is Little Y, Big Evo, um, Teaching Eukaryotic Genetics and Evolution with Yeast. And I will let him take over. All right, can we see the screen? Awesome. Well, thanks for the introduction. Uh, little Y Big Evo is the first time I've heard it uh, said that way, and I love that. Um, so I'm going to share a project called Y Evo today that's a research experience for high school students that I've been working on for the last few years. So one of the philosophies behind my research is I, I care a lot about uh, education and outreach and trying to develop authentic experiences for students. And so I try to take an approach of uh, working with teachers to find the overlap between my research interests and their learning objectives um, so that together we can develop activities for their students that are going to be um, engaging and authentic um, and that can feed back into the research objectives I have in my lab, um, whether that's uh, working to develop um, uh, protocols that are going to generate traditional biological data that can help me to ask questions um, or that might feed into pedagogical investigations. Um, a lot of people have participated in the project I'm going to share today, but I just wanted to acknowledge a few um, who are, are going to feature heavily. Uh, Ryan Scopehammer is a teacher at the Westridge School for Girls who helped to develop YEVO. Uh, my PI, Maitreya Dunham's, played a huge role in influencing the direction of this project and supporting me along the way. Um, and two students, Margot Walson and Cy Gorgefard, uh, have helped out with a lot of illustrations and some experimental details along the way. So my research background is in yeast genetics and evolution. Uh, the budding yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae, as you may know, has been domesticated by humans for thousands of years to play a role in a lot of different um, processes like food production, uh, it's been a workhorse in molecular biology. We're applying yeast to build uh, better biofuels for the future. Um, and uh, cerevisiae is a domesticated cousin of some pathogenic yeasts that would, you might find in a clinical setting um, and investigating mechanisms of drug resistance in this domesticated model can help us to better understand how to treat the pathogenic yeast you might find in the wild. Uh, the typical workflow for the experiments I carry out um, is, uh, uh, can be labeled as experimental evolution. So we take our budding yeast, we expose it to a stressful environment for many generations. Uh, this stressful environment might take environmental factors from different conditions that yeast are exposed to in the wild, whether some, uh, some treatment that a pathogenic yeast would experience in a clinic or um, a stressor like salt that's present in bread that uh, can inhibit baking uh, productivity. After growing the yeast for uh, many generations, we can sequence them. Uh, and thanks to the amazing genome annotation uh, in Cerevisia that you just learned about from the Orphan Project, um, we can start to build mechani a mechanistic understanding of how yeast um, uh, can we can improve these traits in yeast through evolution. So I've been applying this paradigm to a collaborative project with high school students called YEVO. The basic um, material requirements for carrying out an evolution experiment are not that um, challenging to come by. We need things like test tubes and swabs and media, uh, of course, yeast. 
Um, the experiments take a lot of time, but the basic techniques are pretty straightforward, transferring yeast from one tube to another and recording observations about how the yeast are growing over time. Um, and uh, by carrying out these experiments in the classroom, um, we can give students a basic exposure to techniques in microbiology. Um, and then at the end of a series of experiments, I can sequence the student's yeast, identify mutations that play a role in their adaptation, and together we can look through genome annotations to try to build a mechanistic understanding of how the yeast are um, adapting to a given condition. Uh, along the way, we try to uh, build in as many opportunities as possible for the students to uh, develop ownership of their experiments and to have agency in how the experiments are carried out. Um, for instance, in our first iterations of this project, we worked with an over-the-counter antifungal called Fungicure. Students would um, make decisions about how much Fungicure they wanted to expose their yeast to um, and then use sterile swabs to transfer their yeast. Along the way, they had successes like, find, like uh, getting their yeast to grow in a higher dose of the Fungicure. They also had failures like uh, exposing their yeast to too much Fungicure and killing them. Um, but thanks to uh, um, the power of yeast, we can always go back a time point um, to restart an experiment when something like that occurs. Uh, one of the tricks that we worked in to um, uh, make these experiments feasible in the classroom is using a, a set of colorful yeast strains that are engineered with these um, uh, plasmids that encode genes for pigments. Um, the colors both allow us to track lineage of yeast over time to see if there's been a contamination event, um, which have been extremely few throughout the time we've um, uh, implemented this project. They also allow us to do experiments like competitions where we can mix different colors of yeast together, grow them in that stressful condition, um, and then plate them and count colony forming units of each color to determine which yeast has evolved the most resistance. Uh, some of our teachers have turned this into a sort of March Madness experiment where they set up brackets uh, at the end of the evolution protocol um, to see which yeast in the classroom has become the most resistant. So after a few weeks of growth uh, in the presence of the azole that we worked with, um, you can start to see differentiation among uh, the strains. So in these four tubes, the right two are an ancestor and the left two are an evolved lineage from one group. Um, when grown at a low dose of Fungicure, um, the, uh, both the evolved and the ancestor are growing quite robustly, as you can see by how dark the media has become. Um, but when you up to a high dose of the Fungicure, the evolved strain is clearly doing much better than the ancestor. Um, so through simple experiments like this, the students can see that something's happening uh, during the course of their experiment. And then, uh, after we start to see this differentiation among the strains, I sequence the yeast isolates um, and we start to uh, uh, work with the students to provide context to what's happening during this evolution experiment. So the active ingredient in the uh, antifungal that our students worked with is called clotrimazole. It inhibits an essential process called ergosterol synthesis by inhibiting an enzyme called erg11. Uh, and clotrimazole can be exported through a pump called PDR5 that removes drugs from yeast. The pump PDR5 is regulated by a couple of transcription factors called PDR1 and PDR3. And the activity of those transcription factors is regulated by um, a respiration, a cellular respiration. So when we sequence student isolates, we see mutations that uh, fit well into this model. We see um, mutations that uh, likely increase the activity of ERG11, that increase export through that PDR5 pump, um, or that reduce uh, mitochondrial function to relieve inhibition of the PDR1 and 3 transcription factors. Um, so again, thanks to the annotation of the yeast genome, we can provide some context to what's happening in evolution. Um, and thanks to the scale of experiment that we can carry out by working with a distributed network of classrooms, um, we can start to look for new things that are occurring in our student experiments um, that might give us new insights into this phenotype that, again, is relevant to uh, a clinical, um, to the evolution of clinical pathogens. Um, 
So now that I've shared that overview, I just want to come back to the uh, uh, the big picture idea of trying to um, find overlap between my research interests and teachers learning objectives. Um, with the AZOL protocol, we've had a lot of success over the last three years implementing this in classrooms. We've worked with nine teachers at eight different schools in three states. Um, and the data that we're, uh, our students are generating um, is giving us some new insights into how yeast become resistant to these azoles. Um, but as I mentioned before, there are a lot of different uh, phenotypes of interest in yeast. Um, and so we're interested in taking this basic paradigm and applying it to other conditions so that we can frame this activity in different ways based on student and teacher interest um, and gain new insights into yeast biology along the way. Um, as uh, I'm sure many of you have experienced, uh, as the pandemic has caused a lot of schools to shut down, there have also been a lot of disparities in how schools are shutting down. Um, I've seen in my own work that at some schools, uh, work continues as usual over Zoom, whereas at other schools, um, once the lockdown began, instruction essentially ended. I think it's going to be particularly challenging this coming year as uh, based on geography and school funding, uh, some schools are going to have access to opportunities that other schools don't have. Um, and so one way that we've been thinking about uh, a way that we can potentially um, help to ease those disparities is by developing home safe experiments um, that students uh, who are interested in doing some sort of wet lab experience this fall um, might be able to participate in. So while we've been locked down at University of Washington, uh, my lab mates and I, as well as some of our teacher partners and some research at other universities, um, have been uh, developing a kit uh, that we're calling YEVO at home um, that we can send to students or teachers so that they can carry out some investigations on their own. Uh, this is one of our super fancy beta kits uh, in a Safeway bag um, that my lab mate Cindy picked up uh, several weeks ago. Um, and on night, uh, some tubes from one of our graduate students, Soyan Showman. Um, she was evolving yeast to deal with caffeine, which is a TOR signaling inhibitor. Um, and an uh, early encouraging result is that the two tubes on the right seem to be uh, more resistant to the caffeine than the tube on the left, um, just based on the appearance of the culture. Um, we're uh, looking to sequence some isolates from these experiments over the next couple weeks so we can see if um, uh, we can carry out the full investigation using this new um, environmental factor with students uh, this coming school year. Hey Bryce, I'm gonna have to cut you off. Oh, look, your your last slide. Okay, sorry. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> so I just uh, think a, a lot of people have been involved in this project. Uh, really excited about the direction of it going forward. And if you have any further questions, co my contact info is at the top right. All right. I think we have time for two questions, and then we'll we'll try to make sure that Bryce has these other questions. He can get in touch with you guys. Um, so Jennifer, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Um, yeah, sure. You can hear me now? Yes. yes. Um, I was just wondering how long does the t experiment typically take and are the students, how often are they, you know, diluting their cultures, um, you know, thinking about even like in an undergraduate lab where students are there once a week or maybe at home, they're always there, but <laughs> um, how would that, you know, work logistically? Yeah, so we've had, a, we've tailored the amount of time that the experiment takes to what the teachers are interested in devoting. Um, we find that with the Azol protocol, with the Fungicure, um, after about five transfers, we pretty consistently are able to isolate resistant clones. Um, some schools have done transfers every single time they meet in class for a few weeks. Uh, other classrooms have done once a week for um, uh, however long it takes to see the resistance occurring. Um, the actual uh, protocol of what students are doing in a given day in their first transfer usually takes most of the class period as they're getting familiar with how to work with microbes. Um, but after a few transfers, students are generally able to carry this out in maybe 15 minutes of class time. 
Um, so it is a, it's a significant amount uh, over a long period of time, but not so much time um, in any one given uh, class period. Thanks. All right, Yiman, um, would you like to ask your question, which I think might be a yes or no question. Yeah, I'm just yes, saying. it is a very short question. So <laughs> I'm interested in whether we can get a uh, whole of these plasmids and uh, whether you can point me in the right directions where I should request these plasmids. Thank you. Uh, yes, so these plasmids were developed by uh, uh, Jasmine Temple and Jeff Buka at New York University. Um, and I'd be happy to share their contact info. Okay, great. Thank All right, that's awesome. I'm so sorry we don't have time for more questions. These are really great questions. Um, but um, I think we do have to move forward. So Bryce, you can um, mm -hmm. stop your screen share and we will move on to our next speaker, um, um, who is Allison O'Donnell and she's from the University of Pittsburgh. And she's going to talk to us about building a cure. Uh, uh, I like it. building a cure for alpha arrestin. And I will let her take over. Hi, thanks so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to everybody today about my experience in uh, developing a cure for the alpha arrestants. Um, I just want to start today by prefacing this as I was really inspired by um, work by Martha Seyert and Tim Stearns when I worked with them at Stanford University. I got to TA with them one of their course based undergraduate research experiences and I really um, resonated with me and it made me realize what I had been missing as an undergraduate myself who had started an honors biology degree and was really more interested in being my honors lab than doing another purification of alkaline phosphatase for the millionth time that really felt like it didn't have any any meaning and so I, 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 I decided then and there when I worked with uh, Martha and Tim that when I became a professor myself, I wanted to use this kind of pedagogy in my own teaching. So, what is a cure? I mean, I guess you're in this workshop, so you maybe don't need me to uh, define it, but these are the elements that I really tried to incorporate in the cure that I was developing um, for my advanced cell and molecular biology lab. And really, there's so many fantastic resources out there online now. You can check out CureNet to for example, for some, some of these uh, ideas. But we wanted the course to be discovery driven. And I emphasized to my students that no one knows the answer to the question we're gonna propose, not yet at least. Um, and I think that's important to really share that thrill of discovery with scientists or with young scientists. And that was really what was missing in the cookbook undergraduate labs that I took. Um, then there's a component of iteration where students really need to troubleshoot in order to move forward. So they actually have to be invested in figuring out what the answer is and think about the best way to do that in order to keep moving in the course. Um, I want students to be evaluated the same way that we as scientists are really evaluated. And so they either write papers, do oral presentations, or present a poster so they learn how to communicate like a scientist. I really want students to get this sense of project ownership. So throughout the course, it's really student and data driven. So the research goals kind of arise or come out of this, the initial work that the students do. And they get to design their own experiments for the tail end of the course. <clears throat> and I think one of the key things for a cure is that students then become come to feel like they are part of a scientific community because they make a meaningful contribution. So again, they're not purifying alkaline phosphatase for a mil the millionth time. They're actually building on that foundation of knowledge and contributing to advancing research. In this case, the research my lab does. So the other thing I really love about a cure is that it's a great two for one deal, right? So students are engaged in these authentic research experiences. So they're making critical learning gains learning to think like a scientist and they feel more connected to the scientific community and that leads to greater retention in STEM disciplines, especially for minority students. So that's why I think it's so, one, one of the reasons it's so critical. But I also tie that research to my own research program so that um, the findings actually feed right back into my lab. And I think the students really get the best of me this way because I am far more engaged in teaching a class like this than I would be uh, perhaps if it wasn't. Um, involving my own research. And they get to see my enthusiasm for the subject as well. 
So I redesigned a cell and molecular biology super lab for third and fourth year biosci majors. Students could choose this lab out of an assortment of other labs that were offered to fulfill the degree requirements. So that wasn't mandatory. Um, it's capped at around 20 students. And I'm gonna show you data from uh, two iterations of this course that I ran at Duquesne University, but I have also adapted the course for the University of Pittsburgh last spring. And I'm excited to teach two uh, sections of this course in 2021. So it does keep evolving um, as I progress. And I'm not sure how much of it will be virtual, so I'm happy to talk to, to people about that transition to a cure online as well. So in my particular course, we use alpha arrestins and selective protein trafficking really as a prism to understand um, cell and molecular biology fundamentals. So arrestins are this class of trafficking adapters that control the endocytosis of a number of different membrane proteins. And that's regulated through ubiquitination of the arrestin and the membrane protein. And so research in my lab is really interested in figuring out how the alpha arrestins control protein trafficking in response to cell signaling. And these are our research objectives. And the class really focuses on this one, figuring out how signal transduction pathways and post-translational modifications influence alpha arrestin function. So because we're working in yeast, we make use of the power of yeast genetics and we start our lab with a screen. So here's the phenotype we use, and it focuses on two of my favorite alpha arrestins, Alley 1 and Alley 2, and their ability to confer resistance to the drug rapamycin that inhibits TORC1. Um, it also has an interesting tweak to the phenotype in that we know that mutations that cannot be ubiquitinated actually switch the alpha arrestins ability to confer this resistance. In one case, it makes them more resistant, in the other more sensitive. So this is how we build in post-translational modifications into the course. We then screen a high content uh, subset of the yeast gene deletion collection. So we built two subset libraries, one called SCOOBY for Saccharomyces cerevisiae ubiquitin interacting library. So all of those genes, oh, we pull all the genes that are annotated as being associated with ubiquitination. And then the Kindel screen that is just the kinases and phosphatases that are non-essential from the deletion library. Our libraries are arrayed in 96 well format and through using the number of students we have in the class, we do a number of different replicate experiments. And then we introduce through high content transformation, a vector or alley one, alley two overexpressing plasmids and simply look at colony size or score colony size to see whether or not the arrestins are conferring their anticipated rapamycin resistance or not. So here's a picture of how our high content screens happen. We, this is probably the most expensive piece of the course is buying these pin tools. And I think the students always get a kick out of using a hairdryer and kind of this advanced uh, course-based undergraduate research experience, but it's a critical component. And so here's our course roadmap. We start with the transformation and screening. And this again leads to the discovery driven, what are the genes that alter alpha arrestin phenotype? Students then return to the literature and design their own experimental plan with our guidance. But this I think is a key feature for the cure because it drives project ownership for the students. We do some experiments kind of together with students choosing their own gene deletions to follow up on, but we do like validation of the gene deletion, colony PCR, we remake the gene deletion, look at levels of the alpha arrestins and their localization. And again, students understand that they have to go back through this process until we really know that the phenotype associated is, is validated. And then finally, they do their own experiments and really building this third phase in here lets us actually have enough time to get in reagents and get them set up with their own student driven experiments. And I think this is really the biggest driver of project ownership, them getting to see the result of the experiment they designed themselves. And finally, again, we assess them on how they communicate like a science scientist and they make a meaningful contribution. We've moved science forward at the end of this class. I know more about alpha arrestins than I did at the beginning. Oops. <clears throat> so we also do some assessments for this, like self-reported learning gains. We use the CURE survey from the Lopato group at Grinnell College that does an array of different, um, assesses an array of different things, including do students understand science or understand how to analyze data? 
Do they know, uh, do they feel more confident in their ability as a scientist? Um, can they think like a scientist? And so we see, we're happy to see that these changes for our class are on par a little bit better than those reported by national peer surveys, or even summer undergraduate research experiences where students are immersed in research for up to 10 weeks at a time. And these are our same uh, results for 2018. We also do a quantitative learning gains assessment. So we give them a, a test at the beginning that doesn't count towards their grade where they answer some questions linked to the material in the course, like do you understand genetic complementation, et cetera. And then what we do at the end is give them that exact same uh, test at the end. Again, it doesn't count towards their grade, but we do see significant quantitative learning gains here. That means that we're not only getting um, this nice um, qualitative learning gains, but also they're understanding the material. And the two for one deal works. We have discovered the link between alpha rustins and autophagy that is currently going to be written up soon as a paper from my lab and my PhD student Wes Bowman is the focus of his thesis and that came out of our Scooby library screen. And then the Kindle screen also identified new phosphoregulators of alpha rustins, two of which we're studying in my lab and four undergrads from the lab course are still doing science in our lab now. So I think that means they liked it. And I'm happy to talk to you more about how this course came to be and how to design it. And I hope that it helps you do the same thing for your students that Martha and Tim helped me do for mine. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much, um, Allison. So Joshua, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, I think my, my question was for the last. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh, I didn't. I didn't catch it. It was off the thing. I'm so sorry. So, and and probably Alice is like, oh my, when <laughs> she reads the specifics. Um, so, Al so Allison, how um, how have you do? You, so, I love your assessment that you've done. Um, do you have any tools when you track students past your undergraduate experience? Do you track students once they move beyond your lab and and look for impact there? So, I did start doing that, but only last year. So it really isn't, uh, I don't have enough data for that, but it would be, so the way we're doing that is by having students volunteer to keep track with their email. So I will stay in touch with them over email and just touch base with them every year to see what they're up to. But I didn't do that when I was at Duquesne and I actually ran into a few issues even with permissions to do that. So, but I have figured it out now after three years of doing this kind of course. All right. Um, I think we can have one more question. Uh, Michael, do you want to um, go ahead and, and ask yours? And then, I'm sorry, Jack, we'll have to get to yours in that breakout room. Yeah, I just had a quick question about the libraries that you um, detailed, the Scooby and this Kindle library. Can you just provide a little more detail regarding what these are and um, how, how they work with your system? Yeah, so there are about 300 gene deletions from in, in the Scooby screen. And they're basically based off a search of SGD for anything that was annotated as being able to interact with or modify ubiquitinated, you know, create ubiquitinated proteins. And if it was a non-essential gene, it got incorporated into this library. Um, and then for the Kindle screen, it's the same thing. Anything that was annotated as a kinase or a phosphatase and was a non-essential uh, version of those got incorporated into the Kindle library. And actually those libraries are uh, listed, the genes are listed on my website. So if you go check that out, and we're happy to send you uh, stamped copies of those, although they are based off of the open systems gene deletion libraries. All right, thank you, Allison. Um, that's great. So let's move to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Heather Hallen Adams from the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and she's going to speak to us about yeasts in the arena, yeast fights, and more. Um, and I will let um, Heather take over.
and is my my system is my system frozen or is Heather is Heather here? No, I, it's not your system. Oh, okay. Hey, Jessica. Yeah, I think I think this. I, can you hear me now? Oh yes, there we go. <laughs> okay. Yay. When, when you started my screen sharing, it locked me out from being able to touch my microphone. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So um, you're good now. Do you think you can screen share or? I, I oh, awesome. Can, okay. Yes. Yay! Thank you. Sorry about that. No. Um. So. Uh, this class is from a class I developed in molds and mycotoxins, a food mycology class I teach in the Department of Food Science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And the class tends to be a smallish class around 10 or 12 students, juniors, seniors, and uh, graduate students. And the basic idea is that we're We've kind of compiled over the years a number of our different yeast labs into one big super lab that takes place over about three weeks in the classroom, probably about five class sessions as I commandeer some of the lecture classes for this as well. Uh, but as some of our other speakers like Bryce and Allison have mentioned, I think it's very important to have student ownership of the projects. And in this case, uh, the students begin with capturing their own yeast. And they capture it, they isolate it in pure culture, they characterize it, and then it kind of fulminates with our testing of killer activity. So capturing, uh, I give this assignment two weeks before we actually need the yeast. So I give them time to find their yeast, uh, some suggestions are to use just fruit juice or sugar water exposed at room temperature, fruit in room temperature water. Uh, some classes have done this with a yeast from a wild sourdough starter. You can, if the students are 21 or older, you can go into some alcoholic beverages and sometimes capture yeasts or fermented foods, especially kombuchas that are advertising probiotic capacity, uh, that's another source of yeast. And this picture here is just a couple cherry tomatoes that I had on the counter that were attracting fruit flies, which as you probably know are really more yeast flies than fruit flies. Uh, the day I put them in the water and then after they'd been sitting outside at our nice 90 degree Nebraska summer temperatures for a couple of weeks. So once the students have their yeasts, they bring them in and we streak them on chromagar candida, which contains chromogenic substrates really designed for the differentiation of candida species based on what uh, sugars the yeast is utilizing. And as you can see on the plate on the far left, there's a little bit of everything. There's, there is a mold growing there as well. We see a couple different colors. We see the purple and we see the pink ones. Uh, then we'll restreak on Canada to obtain pure isolates and then transfer those pure isolates onto any media, PDA, Sabra, dextrose, whatever, uh, for growth and maintenance. Uh, Chromagar is kind of expensive to use every day. Uh, so the students can then characterize their yeasts. Uh, morphology, they can look at the color on chromagar, they can look at the color on the native color of the yeast. Uh, here again we have sabarods and you can see we have a couple of reddish yeasts. Uh, in my experience that's probably more often myrozyma pulcherima, but uh, rotatorulose you can get some other things. You have white, you have creamy, you have some that have seem to have some kind of pseudohyphal growth going on. Uh, so we can look at all of those characteristics, micromorphology, look at them under the microscope, all of that fun stuff. Uh, DNA will do an in-class extraction using the bust and grab protocol published by Harju, and that's basically effectively a boil and mini prep. You're just tossing the yeasts in a CTAB buffer into 100 degrees and bouncing back and forth between 100 and minus 80 a couple of times get the yeast out and then just to chloroform rinse uh, ITS-PCR. We send them off for Sanger sequencing. They can blast the results and determine what their yeasts are. 
and then they can compare this data with Kurtzman's The Yeasts, uh, available fully online through the Westerdijk Institute or I have the hard copy books as well. And I guess one thing I forgot to mention, uh, they also do the uh, API assay. So we do the physiology, we look at uh, what sugars they utilize, and then they can compare that with Kurtzman. And then the big thing everyone looks forward to is the killer assay, the yeast fights. And we set it up so every yeast uh, is paired off against every other yeast in a methylene blue seeded agar assay. Uh, so one yeast is the seed added to the agar at about 40 degrees, and then tester yeasts are streaked on the plate and an area of clearing as shown by the arrows in this figure indicates that the tester is killing the seed yeast. Uh, for this, we need known and approximately equal quantities of each yeast. Uh, we aim for about 1.5 times 10 to the sixth CFU per mil, and the uh, source of the assay is printed at the bottom there. And that part is a little time consuming. I've generally done that myself, or the TA have, just take an hour or two before the lab uh, with a hemocytometer and have fun sorting out those yeast volumes add one mil of that prepared proper volume yeast to the petri plate, add the methylene blue auger, uh, swirl it to suspend the yeast, let it solidify, and then streak or spot with the tester strain. We use a predetermined grid so it's easy to compare different plates, and then incubate for 48 hours at 30. So the results we had from 2019, we had 14 students and 20 strains, a few students got more than one. Uh, two of them were pretty much neutral, neither killed nor were killed. Three didn't kill but were killed. Seven killed but were not killed. And then eight both killed and were killed. And you can see kind of the breakdown. Good differentiation of different killer capacity in the yeast. And again, uh, Bryce mentioned the bracket. That's something we've talked about doing. Uh, I do have a colleague in Benedictine that we were thinking about doing that this past year and then just didn't make it that far, but that is something we can do in the future. And I definitely found the students really got into the yeast fight aspect of the class. I had people in a surface lab that had yeast that had come into the lab and I know the grad students had a betting pool going on for which yeast was going to win and all kinds of things going on there. So there really seemed to be a lot of student buy-in into this lab. Uh, for doing it at home, there are definitely aspects that can be done at home, definitely capturing the yeast. Uh, if students are, I think it would work best with students in state or at least in country. Uh, Yeasts could be sent into the lab for us to do some of the, uh, certainly the DNA extraction and the killer pair off and then share the data with them. Uh, Chrome auger could be sent to the students. So there are uh, a variety of ways that could be used to work in a distance setting. And that is my talk. Thank you for your attention. I'm going to stop sharing and so I can see any questions. All right, does anybody have any questions? How expensive are those chrome auger plates? The chrome auger itself, I think, runs around $400 for about four liters worth. Okay. That could be off on that. But yeah. It's not terribly cheap and it, they're, it's very proprietary. So you know that Candid Albacans, for instance, is green because right. of yeah. its sugar utilization profile, but they're not telling you what the chromophore is or what sugar is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. I think that um, we are running a little bit behind, so I'm gonna, gonna go ahead and move on to our next speaker. Um, we have Katerina Jurikova um, from Comenius University in Slovakia. Um, she's going to speak to us about hands-on CRISPR-Cas9 and Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and I will hand it over to her. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. Um, 
All right, so um, I would like to um, start with thanking the organizers for putting together this, um, this interesting workshop and also for the opportunity um, to present our work. Um, I will talk about a practical course we developed as a part of the undergraduate curriculum at the, uh, at the Department of Genetics at the Faculty of Natural Sciences um, at Komunis University in Bratislava in Slovakia. Our main motivation was to bring to our students in the Master Program of Genetics, Modern Methods in Molecular Genetics, and so we chose CRISPR-Cas9. Um, very briefly, um, an introduction. Um, CRISPR-Cas9, as uh, you all probably know, is a technique allowing for fast and efficient editing of the genome. It is based on the action of Cas9, the nucleus enzyme um, able to cut double-stranded DNA and the guides RNA that targets uh, Cas9 to a selected location in the genome. When the CRISPR-Cas9 system is introduced in the cell along with the repair template, it allows for a targeted integration of a specific asset in the genome. The efficiency and simplicity of CRISPR-Cas9 has made it a very rapidly spreading tool applicable in a spectrum of model organisms. Um, moreover, other variations such as dead Cas9 or Cas9 UKs have been derived, making the tool even more versatile. So CRISPR-Cas9 has become a method of the day in molecular genetics. For this reason, we, dis we um, designed a practical um, five-week undergraduate course aimed at the application of CRISPR-Cas9 method in the genome editing of the Baker's yeast Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Um, our primary goal was to bring to our students as much practical experience with the method as possible. And for this, we made the course full hands-on. So the students participated on every single step of the protocol. We also strived to make it robust. And so we included a number of backup plans in case the experiments performed by the students wouldn't work out. For the course to fit in uh, our existing curriculum, we designed it to be flexible so that many steps can be included or omitted depending on the number of hours available and the students' levels of experience. Uh, lastly, in an attempt to make the course sustainable long-term, we designed the experiments also to be inexpensive. Here is an outline of the activities uh, briefly illustrating the logic of the course. The aim of the mutagenesis was to disrupt the ADA2 gene, which leads to a buildup of red pigment in the cells, uh, which is visually easily identifiable as pink colonies. Uh, the students started with bioinformatic design of the sgRNA, then performed the molecular cloning, uh, continued with transformation of the prepared vector um, in the yeast cells, Next, they selected a transformant and performed colony PCR, followed by a restriction digestion to confirm the presence of the expected mutation. Uh, now, into a little bit more details. Um, in the first seminar, the students were introduced into the topic by a one hour long presentation about the technique and its applications. Then the students uh, performed the bioinformatic design of the sgRNAs Using a web tool developed by the authors of the study we based, we based the mutagenesis on. Uh, their task was to understand the output of the software and pick the sgRNA that would best fit the needs of the, of the experiment. In the, in the second seminar, the aim was to subclone the sgRNA gene into the bcl one swab one side of the vector carrying also the Cas9 gene. Uh, students um, were given a previously rehybridized um, sgRNA fragment that they were supposed to um, ligate with a linearized vector that was then um, transformed into, um, into bacteria. Here, the flexibility of the course uh, could be taken advantage of because all the, all the steps that are, that are here marked in red were performed by the instructors, but if the time or student experience allows it, they can be also performed by students. Um, the third seminar included the analysis of the sequencing results and the uh, transformation of the yeast, for which all the students used the plasmid with the correct sequence. 
Together with the plasmid, we also transformed a cassette that would be used as a repair template. A successful integration of this cassette would have a triple effect. It carries a mutated pump site, which prevents the Cas9 endonuclease from binding the sequence again, then brings a frame shift mutation into the uh, AD2 open reading frame and introduces a restriction site for, for ECO R1 uh, that is not present in the original AD2 gene sequence and would later allow for, for efficient screening. In the fourth seminar, the students evaluated the results of the transformation, selected the pink colonies for further analysis, and performed colony PCR, um, which was a success for almost all students. In the last seminar, the PCR product was digested by ECO R1 to differentiate between mutants that carry a repair cassette and the mutants that had the ADA2 gene disrupted by error prone end joining after a Cas9 cut. As a result, most, most students were able to see two fragments on the final gel that meant that the CRISPR-Cas9 mutagenesis proceeded as planned and the repair cassette was integrated in the genome in the majority of screened colonies. In summary, um, we have now been organizing this course for three years and for two years it has been a part of a larger mutagenesis course. The course has been completed by approximately 60 students so far. Um, recently we also developed an accompanying study material and we also performed a survey of students' opinions on the course in the form of questionnaire. Uh, based on the questionnaire, the students considered the CD materials helpful in understanding course aims and in following the logic of individual experiments. Uh, most of the last year students also would feel mm, comfortable performing an independent CRISPR-Cas9 experiment based on a protocol or literature. The main caveat of the course as perceived by the students is the several week span of the course. However, we believe that uh, by omitting some of the more time consuming steps, the course could also be implemented as one week intensive training. In conclusion, um, we have developed a flexible, robust and full hands-on practical course on CRISPR-Cas9 in the East that starts with the design of sgRNA and ends with the analysis of the genotype of the mutant yeast. Our course has proven to be engaging to students who gained confidence in performing a CRISPR-Cas9 experiment and has now been integrated in the standard genetics master degree curriculum. With a summary, I would like to thank first of all our students for their patience uh, during the development of this course, uh, the Tatra Banka Foundation for financial support, you for your attention, and I will be happy to take any questions um, now or later. All right, anyone have any questions? Katerina, what was the biggest barrier to actually developing this as a full course? Um, Not to be negative. <laughs> no, but, I mean, you know. um, well, to be completely honest, I would say that the biggest barrier was just making the decision. Because at the time we decided to, to develop this course, um, there was a um, coincidence of uh, some lucky circumstances. So there was an open grant call that would support innovative teaching techniques like this. Um, one of the research groups at our department starting um, including CRISPR-Cas9 into their research. And um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I, I, um, everybody, I really want to thank, one of the most awkward things is that we don't get to all clap at the end of each presentation. I find that really, really weird, but um, I think everybody's probably virtually, there we go. We got some virtual claps going on for the speakers. Thank you guys so much. Um, I think that uh, this was really great talks. Um, I, I'm hoping everybody was sort of thinking about their home institution and how they might um, gain from hearing all this really great information.